Hello and welcome to Slate Money, your guide to the business and finance news of the week. I'm Felix Salmon of Axios. I'm here with Elizabeth Spires of New York Times and various other places. Hello. I'm here with Emily Peck of Axios. Hi. We have a very special episode this week all about making the world a better place. We have Mr. Bjorn Lomborg. Welcome, Bjorn. I can say hi or hey. <laughs> <laughs> you can say hi or hey. You can be you can be Danish or English. I think for this for this purpose you will be uh English. Uh Danish is a little bit rusty around these parts. Um introduce yourself. Who are you? And tell me, what is the book you have just published? So my name is Bjorn Lombor. I'm Danish, as you uh, mentioned, uh, but I'll speak in English. I, uh, I run a think tank called the Copenhagen Consensus, uh, where we bring together tons of the world's best economists. Uh, we work with seven Nobel laureates in economics to basically try and find out if you want to spend an extra dollar, where can you do the most good? Uh, we've done that for the world. We've done it for Bangladesh and many other uh, individual countries. Uh, but now we're doing it for the world again, but for a specific uh, purpose. The world has decided it's going to do all good things in the world called the Sustainable Development Goals. We're not actually achieving it. So here is a book that suggests 12 amazing things that the world could do at very low cost that will deliver amazing benefits. So we're going to talk about a few of those things, about the whole conceptual underpinning behind the book, a few of the different ways it can work and how it would work in practice, whether it would work in practice. It's all coming up on Slate Money. This episode is brought to you by Schwab. Do you ever think about your money? I'm sure you do. You probably think about it all the time. But guess what? Your money's been thinking about you too. And it wants you to know that a financial plan can lead to 2.7 times higher net worth on average. That's why Schwab makes starting one easier than ever with one-on-one -on -one guidance from a financial consultant and a complimentary online retirement plan that you can start in as little as 15 minutes. Plus, track your progress with free digital planning tools. So what are you waiting for? Visit schwab.com slash plan today to learn more. Hey there, Slate Money listeners. Before we start the show, I want to let you know about a story coming up a little later. It's from one of our partners, SAP. Is your business reaching an exciting turning point? Are you ready to seize the moment for growth? Well, when you're facing tough decisions, SAP can help you be ready for anything that happens next. To learn more, head to sap.com slash be ready. And stick around to hear how the president of an esports league seized the moment. Let's start with the central concept of the book, which is basically if you're a government or a philanthropist or anyone who wants to change the world, there is this very quantitative lens which you should use before doing anything, and you call it a benefit-cost relationship. Is, is that pretty much the, the very big overarching message of the, of the book? It is. You just summarized uh, all, all my 300 pages. So <laughs> benefit cost analysis. So fu fundamentally, we focus on a lot of things in the world and there is a lot of issues. Uh, and we often tend to get sort of slightly derailed by you know the causes that have the cutest animals or the most crying babies or the groups with the best PR. Uh, and that all makes sense. But what we try to do is to say, well, actually, there's possibly a lot of fairly boring things that would have huge impact at very low cost. Shouldn't we know about that? So we're basically making, if you will, a price list for some of the best things you can do in the world. Let's talk a little bit first about the concept of measuring what you call the sizes and the prices using the same measuring stick, which is dollars. Every idea in your book, even something like we should switch to e-procurement e or we should do more trade like is it comes with a price that like this is the cost of it in dollars and then it comes with a benefit in dollars and even if the benefit is you know kids get better education you you put a, a dollar price on that and i know that 
people can feel a bit uncomfortable with just saying, like, how do you make all of these very incommensurate things commensurate by like reducing them all to dollars? Is that really possible? Remember, we do this all the time. So when you go into a supermarket, you really do put into dollars very, very different things, not just apples and oranges, but you know, all the things you buy, they all have price tags on them. But it doesn't mean that we shouldn't be concerned about, are, are we doing the right thing here? What economists try to do is to say, well, what's the cost? Well, typically, most of the cost is actually going to be dollars. If you want to get kids better education, you have to pay for you know, more schools or better teachers or uh, better teaching equipment, that kind of thing. If you want to save people from tuberculosis, you need to pay for uh, you know, the drugs and uh, you have staff of medical uh, people and all that stuff. That's sort of understandable. But the real issue and what I think you're aiming at is how do we measure the benefits in terms of dollars, because that's that's sort of obviously that feels wrong, right? Because it's uh, children flourishing more, it's children knowing more, it's it's uh, people not dying. Those are obvious things that we shouldn't be putting into money. But remember, we do all the time. And let me just give you one example. Uh, so uh, when when the uh, Department of Transportation in the U.S. and pretty much everywhere else in the world decides. We have this road. Should we make it more safe? Should we make a middle divider or something? They essentially make a trade-off between saying, if we make it safer, it means fewer people will die in this road, but it also costs more money. And typically what they do, and this is not unsmart because they've also given this a lot of thought, right? They, they think if we can do it really cheaply and save a lot of people, it's a good idea. If, we, if it'll cost a lot of money and you can only save very few people, maybe we won't do it. It turns out that the U.S. government consistently, not totally consistently, but reasonably consistently. One thing I thought that was interesting in your book is you had these great charts um, and you would chart all these problems that have improved, you know, in the rich world incredibly, like um, – the incidence of infectious diseases or the literacy or education. And I thought, you know, the the rich world didn't set out as the primary goal to solve any of these particular problems. The rich world just got rich and the problems got solved. And so nitpicking, well, not nitpicking, but choosing based on this very complicated cost-benefit analysis, which problems to go after, maybe obfuscates what would be an easier solution or maybe a harder solution, which is for the developed world to get richer, because that's what's going to solve all these problems in a much bigger way more quickly. Like if you look at the numbers on China, right? China didn't set out to solve infectious disease or child wasting or anything like that. China decided to do more capitalism and they got richer. And then a lot of these problems went away. So, so you're absolutely right. I mean, uh, for, for the developing world, for the poor part of the world, uh, if you get rich, you will solve many of these problems. That's yeah. absolutely true. The, the problem is it's not very obvious. How do we go about getting richer now? You, know, you could say, well, everyone should do like China. That's clearly hard because do only China. China managed to do that right now. Uh, so, so it's not that that's not a good other idea. And we should certainly recognize the fact that if you – get more economic growth, you lift out a lot of people from poverty. And that's one of the biggest problems in the world. So absolutely, we should be focused on that. We actually address that partly in the book with trade. We know that one of the things that made China rich is that they got to be the world's workshop. They basically got to trade a lot. And that's one of the ways that you get rich. You know, you, you don't have a, 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 a tremendously high wage, but you actually are pretty well-educated people. You sell to the U.S. and everybody else. We pay them good money and they get richer from it. That's a good idea. And we should make sure that more people get that opportunity. In the rich world, we've become sort of slightly disillusioned with uh, trade because it leads to the Rust Belt and all these other problems. And those are real issues. Uh, but we should still remember how good this is uh, for a lot of the uh, uh, poor part of the world. So let me ask you the same question the other way around, which is you, you have a chapter at the beginning which basically said we, you know, a few years ago had these wonderful things called the Millennium Development Goals, and a lot of them came very close to being met. Some of them actually were met. Um, and I think most of us will remember things like the um, Global Fund to fight 
you know, AIDS and other diseases in Africa. There was Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance, also in Africa. Um, literacy rates, especially for girls in Africa, has have gone up enormously. Um, the mortality rate for kids under five in most of sub-Saharan Africa has really plunged. There's been a lot of sort of humanitarian successes. And these are precisely the kind of things that you are saying we need more of and you're trying to sort of quantify in this book. But like looking backwards, using the same methodology that you use in this book, you know, you would you would conclude as a result of these successes, you know, the fact that Africa was not wiped out by AIDS as everyone thought it would be in the early nineties, um, that Africa is now you know however many hundreds of billions of dollars richer as a result of what the Global Fund did. Um, have you done the sort of benefit cost analysis on things that have actually worked in the past on those kind of things and? have we managed to do incredible things in the past that we're just not singing loudly enough about? Mm -hmm. So we've, we've done a little bit of back of the envelope uh, kind of argument on, on those things. Uh, I think the main reason why we haven't done it is because it's sort of, you know, it's, it's intellectually interesting, but we're past that. Uh, we've done that. It doesn't actually help policy. But the main point here is, Again, to say that that most of what we've done is is looking a, a, ahead, and and what you rightly point out is uh, we were very good at, at the Millennium Development Goals, which ran from two thousand to two thousand fifteen, to say let's do a very few specific, mostly really smart stuff, and we achieved a lot. But then you know the UN uh, said, "Oh wow, this went really well. Let's do this again." Uh, but the problem was that these Millennium Development Goals literally were set by six guys in a back room in the UN. You know, Kofi Annan and six, five others. Uh, and and the story is that, that they met uh, the uh, uh, the environment uh, 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 the guy who ran the environment. Uh, agency uh, a couple of days before they were going to launch and they were like, oh, we don't have any environment. So they put in an environment target as well, which was uh, then uh, 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 water and sanitation. And, you know, that's probably not the way you want to do global goals kind of thing. So this time around, they said, let's ask everyone what they think should be in these global goals. Not surprisingly, when you ask everyone, you get everything in there. It, they, we ended up with an enormous package of stuff uh, ranging from to, uh, going from 2016 up to 2030, where we basically promised everything. We promised to fix hunger and malnutrition, and, sorry, hunger and poverty and uh, 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 war and corruption and climate change and uh, uh, jobs and, and uh, education and, you know, get urban, uh, more urban parks and, and uh, more sustainable ter uh, tourism. And, you know, th there's literally not anything in there that's not you know, promising something for whatever field you're in. Uh, we promised everything to everyone. And so this year, 2023, the world is at halftime for the uh, SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, and we're nowhere near halfway. We're just basically failing. Even the Secretary General is now saying uh, we're far off track on, the, on our promises. And so what we're trying to say is, look, if you're promising everything, you're not going to get anything done. You have no priorities. Let's focus on some really simple, smart stuff. But they're, they're not that simple, Bjorn. I mean, I, I, I have a bunch of things I want to sort of respond to here. But like the first thing is, the, with the vast majority of your 12 simple things are the kind of things that really can and must only be implemented by domestic governments in various developing countries. I think probably the malaria one is is the exception. Um, but most of the rest of them, especially things like, oh, we, you know, governments should move to e-procurement or we should implement more trade or even stuff around education, you know, but perforce must wind up being done through government departments, through the political system, through whatever, you know, authoritarian or democratic, you know, system you have in any given country. And it strikes me that that is never going to be simple. And it's never going to be something you can just magically make happen with by writing a check. 
So look, look, and this is very, very important. So what, what I mean by simple is this is something that we've actually demonstrated how to do in many different circumstances. So let me take one example, uh, uh, which is education. Uh, we both say how you shouldn't do education. So there are lots of things where government has spent enormous amounts of resources on education and gotten very trivial or no uh, output. For instance, Indonesia, uh, 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 famously in the early 2000s, uh, you know, very well-intentioned, decided they were going to spend twice as much money on education. So they hired a lot more teachers. They doubled the uh, the wage of each teacher, uh, and and because of the way it was it was uh, rolled out, it actually happened in different regions at different times. And so uh, you can make a, a, a pseudo randomized controlled trial study, and they did, uh, and it's a very famous paper. It's called Double for Nothing. Uh, so basically. The Indonesians spent twice as much money. They have one of the lowest class size uh, class sizes in the world, and you could not measure the impact on uh, uh, educational outcome. Now, the teachers are much happier, which is great, but presumably not the main goal of uh, of educational policy. So, fundamentally, you can spend a lot of money and achieve nothing. So this is not what we should be doing. Yeah, in your analysis, how do you weigh cost effectiveness against urgency? And time sensitivity? We don't. We only look at what is the cost. Typically, the cost is right now, but sometimes it'll be over you know, a number of years. For instance, if you try to fix tuberculosis, it doesn't help just try to fix it one year. You actually need to fix it a lot of years before it sort of sticks. Uh, the same thing with many other infectious diseases. But most of the cost is right now. The benefits, depending on which kind of problem you're looking at, come right now. For instance, if you if you give uh, immunization, uh, most of the kids that you immunize will survive just that year when they get the immunization. Now, some of them will you know, dribble in 60 years later, but most of it is right now. Uh, unlike, for instance, education, where you uh, teach the kids better now, but the benefits really only come in 10, 20, 30, you know, 50 years when they get into the employment market all the way till uh, they retire. That was the sound of another sale on Shopify. The moment another business dream became a reality, Shopify is the platform that powers people who sell just about anything, just about anywhere. It is revolutionizing literally millions of businesses around the world. It is packed with industry-leading tools which are ready to ignite your growth. It has 24-7 help, an extensive business course library. It is there to support your success every step of the way. So whether you're selling fine art prints or succulents, Shopify simplifies the selling bit so you can focus on growing your business. Now it is your turn to get serious about selling, so try Shopify today. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash money, all lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash money to take your business to the next level today. Shopify.com slash money. This podcast is brought to you by Slate Studios and SAP. How do you know when to seize the moment for growth? When your opportunity arrives, you need to be ready. From expanding into new markets to hiring, business leaders face so many tough decisions. My name is Brendan Donahue, president of the NBA 2K League. The NBA 2K League is a professional esport run by the NBA and 2K, where we take 30 million people who play the game of NBA 2K and we find the best 125 in the world to compete in our league. In March of 2020, the start of the pandemic spurred the league to take steps it never imagined. And with SAP tools, they knew they were ready. We could have postponed our season like a lot of other sports leagues did. We decided to seize the moment. We created a competition that could be done virtually. We had the NBA 2K League on major sports networks for 17 weeks. That moment gave us a chance to talk to a mass audience across the world. So the majority of our fans, less than 1% will ever step foot in an NBA arena to watch a game live. But you have this significant fandom and excitement for the game. And so that's really where we think we play a role. Our first season, we had 650,000 people watch our finals in season one. Now our finals this past year, we had 2.2 million people watching. 
NBA 2K League seized the moment for growth. Will you? Head to sap.com slash be ready to learn more. If you want to hear our amazing Slate Plus bonus segment where we talk about land title and how it can create trillions of dollars of wealth around the world, become a Slate Plus member. There are no ads on Slate podcasts, not even this one. If you listen to Slate Plus, you will be supporting the podcast. Slate Plus helps keep this show going. Um, you'll be getting bonus segments not only on Slate Money, but also Slow Burn, Amicus, Political Gab Fest, Working, all manner of Slate podcasts. You will learn amazing drops of knowledge from Bjorn Lomborg and various other guests. And you have unlimited reading on the Slate website. Access to every article ever published and every advice column. And you never hit the paywall. So become a member at slate.com slash money plus. That's slate.com slash money plus. So this, this raises one of the two big questions that i have about the whole like underpinning of the book which is it's based on on two numbers um one of them is the discount rate that you're talking about and the other one is the um value of a life year um and it strikes me that where you end up with all of these 12 different chapters is incredibly is very very deeply a function of where you set those two numbers like in the appendix at the end of the book um the fact that you're valuing a life per year um results in a bunch of interventions for children and infants because those lives are worth much more than if you save the life of a 40 year old and half their life is gone already so um you know, so so that's one thing you do, and then also because you actually mention this in the book, like there's this weird cutoff that if you um, if you prevent a stillbirth, that is considered much less beneficial than if you prevent a baby from dying, you know, at like one week, because that's not a life you you know saved. And these kind of weird um, paradoxes. At one point. Um, it, you mentioned that like saving children's lives is worth billions of dollars, but at the same time, if you get um, women to have fewer babies, that's also worth billions of dollars. And it's like, well, which one do you want? Do you want more? <laughs> do you want more children, or do you want fewer yes. children? Um, so there's yep. like a lot of this just comes from like that one life year thing. And then similarly on the on the discount rate thing, you have a relatively high discount rate, which means that you do wind up. Um, pushing things like immunizations and, you know, uh, bed nets, which save lives relatively quickly at the expense of, say, um, climate interventions that would take decades and decades to, to get moving. If you set a very low discount rate, that is, you basically say the future is incredibly important. Everything becomes much, much better deal, especially things that are far away. But remember, uh, and we've actually tried to get our researchers to do this, but it turns out that this is this is almost impossible to do. If if you start thinking about, uh, uh, for instance, you know, p- people in the climate conversation will say, but surely the very far off future where climate policy will have a much greater impact is hugely important as well. But remember, if if the future is hugely important, then helping people with malaria today not just means that these people will survive but that their kids will be much better off because not only will they actually have a mom instead of not having a mom, uh, but they will also have much more opportunity to give them uh, you know, capital support and give them education. And it'll have huge impacts and possibly incredibly large impacts uh, in the far future. And then you very easily get to this very paradoxical uh, outcome that has also been remarked in, in the climate debate. If you put a very low discount rate that is, the future is incredibly important. The outcome becomes, you know what? All of us should just eat porridge and then leave all the rest of the money to future generations, which of course should also just eat porridge and leave all the money to future generations and so on, because the indefinite future is just way too important. And, and there, I think the, the important point is just to recognize nobody actually does this. You know, we, 
typically well, sort we of know say, where, we know where that logic li- en- ends up beyond because we saw the headlines it ends up with sam bankman fried trying to buy the island of nauru <laughs> with his long term I'm, I'm not sure that's true but i, I get i get the funny point uh, but but yeah you know, look i you know it it ends up with us saying we care about the world and and i think this is an important part i i love the fact that a lot of people really do want to help the world and so we're willing to you know spend i don't know two three four five percent of our income to try to make the world better but we're not willing to spend you know say 50 or 75 or 97.5 percent which is one famous climate outcome uh we're not willing to spend that much money on the rest of the world so what we do do is we try to say we're going to set aside a non-trivial but not an enormous amount of, of money for the rest of the world how do we best spend that and that's the answer that we try to deliver the message of the book is like here's how we can spend money to change the world so it seems like it's like a guide for the richer countries and the richer people in the rich countries to give to the developing world how much input has the developing world had on these ideas or how involved in they are saying like these are the problems we want solved because it, it seems kind of um, colonialist. <laughs> colonialist, yeah, it seems colonialist basically to be like this is what we think you should do because we want to feel better about having a lot of money and being better off than you. I actually address that straight up front in the book. Uh, I, I say what we means, namely that we means. Every, every one of goodwill. So it is philanthropists who want to do good. It is uh, develop, develop governments, so the USAIDs of the world, but it's also developing countries. These are, these are great investments for all three of them, and we're trying to argue for all, all of them. So I've actually uh, uh, presented this in a lot of uh, developing countries. We work with a lot of developing countries. Uh, uh, so all of these inputs into the sustainable development goals, which is what we take our starting point from, comes from uh, 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 basically uh, making sure that you have everybody's input, so both rich and poor countries. But what we're trying to do is then say, what does the uh, the period literature tell us? Where are the best deals? And those are presumably not something that matters whether you're rich or poor. This is simply about saying, where are the best deals? in the poor half of the world. And this is true both for poor countries or for development agencies from the rich world. And so I'm trying to tell both. I'm actually trying to tell everyone, you know, this is where you get the biggest bang for your buck. Whether you're a poor poor country government that wants to do good for its citizens or whether you're a rich country that through development aid wants to do good in poor countries. I just can't imagine uh, philanthropists Telling the United States government, these are the, I mean, I guess it happens a lot. These are the programs you must do. We know better than you. You know what I mean? It's so, just, I mean, yes. they, so they do it's, that. It's incredibly, <laughs> okay, yeah. I am not, and I hope I'm not coming across that way. I'm not saying we know better than you. What we are saying is that this is what the literature shows are some of the best deals available. Uh, you know, so we work with uh, the Indian government, uh, Niti Aayog, which is their, uh, their central uh, think tank to uh, look at where you spend uh, resources. We've done the same thing for Bangladesh, for Ghana, for Malawi, uh, for a number of other countries, uh, including Uganda and Eswatini. Uh, we're, we're right now working with Tonga and the uh, South Pacific. We're, we're working with them all and saying, what does the literature say? And these typically period published uh, economic a- estimates of how much did uh, an intervention cost and how much good did it do? And then we try to advise them to say, here is what the evidence say. If you do this, the evidence seems to suggest you're going to spend a lot of money and get no uh, 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 educational outcome. If you spend it on tablets, however, it costs much less and you get a huge uh, uh, outcome. That is one of the reasons, it's not by any means the only one, uh, that convinced the Malawian government to uh, to actually say we want to get tablets into all of our primary schools, which is, you know, I think, great. And they are working both with their own uh, uh, funds, but also trying to get developed country funds, so both philanthropists and from USAID and others, to actually fund this. So I think this is not, this is not, <laughs> it's certainly not meant as colonial co- colonial or whatever that word is. Uh, but but it also, that's not, this is really just about what does the evidence say. 
So let me ask you, when you go to these countries, um, how how much inter-country difference is there? Because you don't, you, you, you present most of the solutions in this book as basically, if not one size fits all, at least solutions that basically apply pretty much everywhere, maybe, you know, in the case of malaria, mostly just in Africa, but even so, Africa's an enormous continent. Um, you know, I'm thinking, for instance, like you go to India, and I, I am aware that like right now there's a big debate over there building a big, you know, water pipes everywhere, and everyone's saying, well, for a hundred million extra dollars, we can put inline chlorination into these water pipes. And putting inline chlorination into these water pipes is going to save millions of lives, and it's going to be it's like this one off like opportunity to do a lot of good for a relatively small amount of money. But this is not something that would necessarily read across to say Tonga. So how much difference is there between, you know, the the paperback version of this book that people are reading after listening to Slate Money versus like the more sort of concrete recommendations that you that you give governments when you when you visit them on the ground? So there, there's a significant difference uh, uh, in, in two things. So first of all, the book that we're talking about is sort of a, a conversation to the sustainable development goals, which presumably is something that all countries in the government in the world have decided. This is the same uh, 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 same sort of cookie cutter that we're going to put down over every country in the world. Um, so it's in that sort of spirit that I write. Here is some here are twelve amazing things that you could do. Yes, they're not all equal in all countries and yada yada, but we've tried to make a global estimate here, uh, which is not an unreasonable kind of conversation. But obviously, it changes when you go to an individual country. It changes in two ways. Partly, you know, all the setups uh, change. You know, some things. If you're outside of Africa, you don't have malaria, pretty much, uh, and and you know. A lot of other things, which obviously change the factual circumstances. Uh, but the second thing is, it also matters what your politics is. In every country, there are some things that you discuss a lot. So when we went to Ghana, it was it was very much about uh, because the government had just won on uh, promising free uh, 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 secondary school uh, for kids, and that was the big thing. Uh, and, and so that was obviously one of those things that we had to analyze. And how do you do that? And it turned out that there was way too few teachers and too little schools. And, you know, uh, uh, how do you do that? All that kind of stuff. Uh, 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 with India, we've spent a lot of time uh, talking about because this has been one of uh, Modi's big things uh, to get clean drinking water and sanitation. And I actually uh, briefly allude to it in the book because I say that it turned out uh, uh, they didn't like that very much, that this is not the best investment. It's a pretty good investment, but it's not by any means the best investment. Uh, and you know, I, th- I think you need to say that. One of the things that India loves to say is we built all these toilets and that's great. Uh, but unless you actually keep them uh, clean every day, people don't use them. One of the things that we've tried to do with this book is simply to show people there are these 12 amazing, look, it'd be amazing if it was really just 12, right? I mean, but roughly 12 amazing things in the world. How about we start doing some of those? I'm, 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 I would love everybody to do all 12, but you know, I'd be happy if we can just do three or four of them. So on a superficial level, a lot of your argument sounds a lot like what effective altruists argue for. Uh, but they tend to have a long-termist bias. How would you distinguish between the way you prioritize and the way they think about it? Effective altruism is fundamentally the the exact right idea is to say, I want to do good in the world and I want to do it effectively. That's exactly where we agree. I think they tend to like more interesting things. They also go a little bit out more in the sort of philosophical area. And as you point out, uh, they very often go for very, very long-term thinking. One of their big things is that uh, that uh, if humanity uh, is, is worth preserving and this is our long-term future, nothing else really matters. I love reading them. I love talking to them, but I think it's a totally sort of detached from what most people think, which is really... The next year is incredibly important. The next four years are incredibly important. We work with Haiti uh, and uh, as, as one of the governments that we work with when it still only didn't work, but not totally fell apart as it has now. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, honestly, um, nobody in Haiti really cared about stuff that happened four years from now. It was just 
That was, and, and, you know, I think the development also showed that they were right. Uh, you know, you care about making stuff work next year. This episode is brought to you by Bank of America. If you own or operate a business, whether it's a local operation or a global corporation, partnering with Bank of America could be your smartest move. By teaming with Bank of America, you'll enjoy exclusive digital tools, award-winning insights, and business solutions so powerful, you'll make every move matter. Position your business to capitalize on opportunity in a moment's notice. Visit bankofamerica.com slash banking for business to learn more. What would you like the power to do? Bank of America N.A. Copyright 2023. Slate Money is sponsored this week by GiveWell. GiveWell is the place you go to if you want to make a donation and be really sure that your donation is doing the maximum amount of good, that it is saving lives and making a meaningful difference to some of the poorest people in the world. GiveWell has evidence-backed, high-impact giving opportunities. It finds them around the world. It keeps up to date on where the opportunities are greatest. And they share their work with everyone for free. Their website is enormous. You can spend years reading it, and it's really interesting. Over 100,000 donors have used GiveWell to donate more than $1 billion, and rigorous evidence suggests those donations are going to save over 150,000 lives and improve the lives of millions more. You can make tax-deductible donations to GiveWell, and GiveWell does not take a cut. All of their expenses are covered, so it all goes straight to the organizations making a difference on the ground. Go to GiveWell.org to find out more or make a donation. If you make a donation, let them know you heard about us by choosing podcast and enter Slate Money at checkout. Again, that's GiveWell.org. This episode is brought to you by Charles Schwab. Schwab's passion for serving clients is more than standard practice. It's part of who they are. With transparent pricing, 24-7 live support, and a satisfaction guarantee, the people at Schwab go the extra mile to help you on your investing journey. They're not just financial people. They're people people, too. Learn more at schwab.com slash why Schwab. Let me ask you, finally, just about um, how individuals play into this because a lot of what you're talking about is things that are enacted either by like the health ministry or the education ministry or something like that in um, a government somewhere or at the you know one step removed where you have a big powerful western agency like USAID that is able to go into those ministries and twist arms and say like we're going to write you this check just as long as you spend this money on this thing and they can earmark the money and they can shepherd it along and they can bring it out in tranches and make sure it's going to where it's intended to go or at least in theory that's how it works um you know me as a guy writing a you know hundred dollar check like i have no ability to talk to the bangladeshi education minister how do i uh what what's the best way for like a little old me to make a difference and like in my mind it really all it's it's just malaria but maybe i'm wrong about that the big thing i think is to say look you're clearly a person of goodwill you want to help the world you presumably you also you know care about the rest of the world you've certainly read the book so you know you, you now you want to do something i think it's about getting that message out because one of the things that i find constantly so when you go talk to usaid for instance um they're incredibly encumbered by the fact that a lot of Congress people have put all kinds of guardrails in. No, you cannot spend it here. You sh- must spend it this way. And yeah, you know, honestly, it, it feels like a lot of people have, have just put up these regulations because they met with someone who said that you should do this or you shouldn't do that. Uh, and and so help the USAID to actually focus more on the smartest things. And likewise, ask uh, you know make it. Make it not okay to just do something that sounds good, but actually do something that that does good. Uh, a lot of the money that we spend, I, I, I sort of semi facetiously make this argument. A lot of money in in the uh, uh, in the development sphere and uh, philanthropy sphere goes into you know picking up 
straws in the uh, in the Pacific Ocean, that kind of, you know, plastic straw. And clearly that's bad. But, you know, in the big scheme of things, probably not the main issue. You know, if you care about these things, about what, 80, 90 percent of all plastic uh, garbage in the ocean comes from fishery equipment. Maybe we should be more concerned about that if we actually you know, want to care about it. But 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 it's also like as long as, you know, uh, 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 at least the half a dozen uh, million kids die each year from easily curable infectious disease. And maybe that's our uh, a, a slightly bigger issue. And so let's make sure that we don't just you know applaud everybody who spends money, but let's also sort of gently push them what's spending it really effectively in some ways that'll actually have a huge impact. So I, I think that's, this is not a great answer because there is no, no great it, answer. No, I think this, but, is, this know, is exactly the answer that I that I was kind of coming to myself, which is basically the answer that it's all po- it's all political. the The ability that I have as a U.S. citizen is basically the ability that I have to influence Congress, which in turn can influence USAID and, like, you know, work out how much money we're spending on foreign aid, whether we do things like, you know, PEPFAR and Gavi and the Global Fund. Um, the and and for me, you know, it's political one layer on as well, that the influence that France or the Netherlands or Norway has on Malawi or Eswatini or Tonga is, again, going to be mostly political. And, the, you know, you get to twist arms and maybe France goes up to, you know, Botswana and says you should put tablets in schools and it will provide all the money just as long as the tablets are made by a French company. You know, this is the kind of thing that always yes. winds up happening. And and it's my my sort of big picture here is it's politics all the way down. And especially when, you know, you're enumerating the costs so assiduously in dollars, I think we kind of lose track of the fact that the real obstacle here is not actually financial it's inevitably political both at the developing country level and at the developed country level yeah that's what i was trying to say before we're talking about china like china <laughs> has a strong autocratic government that's able to implement policies to enrich itself to make the lives of its citizens better if a country has a strong government that's if not well resourced but resourced and efficient a lot of these problems can be solved within that country and that local government, right? It is a political and government issue more than a money, where do you spend it issue. I, I think you're saying slightly different things, Felix and Emily, because I, I, I feel like, yes, if if the countries are richer, they can fix a lot more. Uh, but Felix- If they have a strong your, government. Your, your, your argument is more that we, it's not actually about allocating more money. It's just about politics. I think- I think there's certainly an argument for partly that politics needs to be clear and more honest about what it is they're trying to achieve. And part of what we can do is to make sure that we held them accountable that, you know, when when governments say, oh, but you need to buy French tablets, we actually say, what? But the, you know, I don't know. I, I'm not even sure there is a, Frank, a French tablet, but it's probably not effective. So, uh, no, <laughs> I'm kidding. Uh, but, you know, uh, but, you know, that we actually say, well, don't we want to do the most effective stuff first? But there is still a lot of money that is not allocated that could go to these amazing things and where we can help. And that's basically what this book is about. Look, if I had the solution, you know, if I just wrote the book and now we have the blueprint and, and all we need to do is to come up with $35 billion and we're all good to go, that would be wonderful, but that would probably be too easy. But I do think we're in some way also lacking the blueprint. And the good example of that, of course, is the world decided on these sustainable development goals. We decided to promise everything to everyone. And then we end up with just, you know, nice sounding uh, 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 sort of canned responses, but not really what will make the world a better place. And so I'm trying to sort of inject a little bit of this. Yeah, no, I definitely, I feel you on that one, that the, the number of, you know, impact investors who I talk to who are like, I judge myself by like, is this company I'm funding going to help the sustainable development goals? It's like every single country company in the world, you can find an SDG somehow that they're helping. Um, But yes, we should um, move on 
and have a numbers round, I think. Elizabeth, do you have a number this week? Uh, yeah, my number is 44, and that's dollars. And this is what you would pay for three ounces of sardines at a new store in Times Square called the Fantastic Times World the of Portuguese the Portuguese Sardines. Sardine. Yes. What? Yes. <laughs> Wait, say that again. <laughs> $44 can of sardines in Times Square. People, you know you want to do it because you know why they do it? They have literally taken out every single bone from inside the sardines so that you don't have to taste the bones, which are perfectly fine to taste. Uh, I'm sorry. They made a sardine store? A s- a sardine store in Times Square? They only yeah. sell sardines, and it's it's a two-story s- store, and they have 30 different kinds of sardines, and then they have this gimmicky thing where they put... <laughs> Can I just jump in and say I've been to this store in, in Lisbon Airport, and it is a great store, and I'm a massive fan of canned fish in general and canned sardines in particular, and I'm all in favor of canned sardines. But yeah, the 44... Don't don't eat the forty four dollar can. That's they put like gold. That flake one in comes it. in a it's, yeah. It comes in yeah. a, a a can shaped like a gold ingot. So. <laughs> and what's the name of the store again? The fantastic the fantastic sardine world? world of the Portuguese sardine. Emily is not convinced <laughs> about this. I'm I'm pretty I sure I know what the location. not to get Emily for her birthday. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wouldn't want to eat a forty four dollar can of sardines. I don't think you know because it was too expensive. It. You would want to save it for special yeah. occasion. Yeah. What's a good occasion? The, what is a special sardine occasion? <laughs> I don't even know. Emily, you have this wonderful look on your face. I'm just going to force you to change the subject. What is your number? <laughs> My number is 24, as in August 24th, which, and this is from a study, you guys, is <laughs> the day of the year that m- people are most likely to call in sick. And this was published in Bloomberg, so I know it's true and factual. (laughs) August 24th is the number one day to call in sick. And it comes from a study from a company that, you know, manages employee absences and medical leaves. And they looked at when people take sick days and August 24th, which was just a couple of days ago. Um, And the intrigue is they don't say what the why August 24th is the day. The second most popular day is the day after the Super Bowl. Bjorn, that's a big football, big <laughs> sports game in the United States. Perhaps you've heard of it. Um, so that one, we understand. Like, people watch it. They go to bed late, whatever. But I don't – why August 24th? So if people have ideas, please write in to Slate Money at slate.com and tell us your theories. I, I, I just want someone to do the um, the same – survey but do it in australia or new zealand or somewhere and if it's january 24th we'll be like okay now we're getting we're getting somewhere here but if it turns out to be april the 16th or something then you're like okay it's not what we think yeah we need further research can your can your team we we need to internationalize the copenhagen consensus can can (laughs) yes this is going to be our goal for the next year things beyond the most important things we ask the big questions yes here in america (laughs) <laughs> I'm going to I'm going to stick with something foodie. Um, my number is 80 million, which is the number of dollars that Subway recently spent. Subway, Bjorn, again, this is something you won't know if you haven't been spending a lot of time in America. <laughs> is uh, is is like Bjorn. the anti tin sardines. It's it's like it's fast food sandwich thing, which is incredibly popular. Um, there are. 20,810 U.S. locations. It has been owned by the same two families basically since it was founded, and now it is for sale because the two founders have both died and a bunch of private equity companies are lining up to buy it. And they've tried to... it It went to a sort of fallow patch a few years back, and they brought in a new CEO. One of the things that the new CEO did was he put meat slices in every location for the first time. And this cost... $80 $80 million, and because I am considerate, I did the maths for you. That works out at $3,844 per location to install a meat slicer. And I think, I mean, obviously that's worth it, right? That's too much. That can't, it can't cost that much to buy a meat slicer. And what do you mean install it? Don't you just like put it on the counter? Put it, put it on the counter. Slicing? I mean, for me, you I am- just had this vision of over- like... <laughs> How long so does some, a meat slicer you know, last? <laughs> True. Some, some guy in like Sheboygan somewhere who runs a meat slicer factory gets a phone call one morning saying, like, I'd, I'd like to order 20,810 meat slicers, please. And he's like, 
this is this is the phone yes. call I have been waiting my whole life for. Yeah. Um, wow. But anyway, Bjorn, bring us home. What is your number? Uh, I'm not surprisingly going to pick something uh, which we just talked about. So my number is 52. Uh, and it's basically the bang for the buck for all these 12 things that we're talking about. Uh, so we're talking about, you know, basically when we try to fix tuberculosis, maternal, newborn health, malaria, nutrition, chronic diseases, the whole shebang that we've been talking about, it'll cost about $35 billion a, a year, but it'll save 4.2 million lives each and every year. And it will generate $1.1 trillion in, in higher economic benefits for the poor part of the world. So that's a, a part of the answer to you, Emily, and on how you actually get people richer. If you take all of that into account, it ends up to being about $2.1 trillion. Or for every dollar spent, you've done $52 worth of good. That's one of the best things that we could possibly do in the world. So yeah, let's do That's it. That's less money than than Elon spent on Twitter, right? Didn't he spend 40 something then? Yes. He spent $44 billion dollars on Twitter. <laughs> Yes, he could have yes. spent thirty-five so, so billion. That's about how much value he's destroyed the Twitter. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's destroyed over a trillion dollars of value. He could have spent on Bjorn's twelve on, things. On our things, yeah. I think I'm right in saying that it's less than the annual budget of the New York City Schools Department. Yeah, and, so and what that, that goes to show, show is just you know doing really smart stuff can be very very cheap. Uh, and you know, it would be fantastically transformational. So again, all the things that we've discussed, and yes, this is not easy, and certainly it, it seems unlikely that you can just use this 52 number, a little bit like the 42 number from, from uh, what's his name, Douglas The Hitchhiker's Adam. Guide to the Galaxy? Yeah, yeah Douglas <laughs> Adams. Guide to the Galaxy. You, yeah, you can't just you know, put out one number and say, oh, that explains the whole world. But it does give you a great sort of, a uh, 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 base from which to have this discussion. With that, Bjorn Lomborg, thank you so much for coming on the show. It's been brilliant having you here. Wonderful. Um, thanks, to everyone, for, uh, <laughs> for, for listening. Thanks for writing in, slatemoney at slate.com. Thanks to Patrick Bort for producing. And we'll be back next week with more Slate Money. This episode is brought to you by Bank of America. If you own or operate a business, whether it's a local operation or a global corporation, partnering with Bank of America could be your smartest move. By teaming with Bank of America, you'll enjoy exclusive digital tools, award-winning insights, and business solutions so powerful, you'll make every move matter. Position your business to capitalize on opportunity in a moment's notice. Visit bankofamerica.com slash banking for business to learn more. What would you like the power to do? Bank of America N.A. Copyright 2023. Hey, everybody. It's Tim Heidecker. You know me, Tim and Eric, Bridesmaids and uh, Fantastic Four. I'd like to personally invite you to listen to Office Hours Live with me and my co-hosts, DJ Doug Pound. Hello. And Vic Berger. Howdy. Every week we bring you laughs, fun, games, and lots of other surprises. It's live. We take your Zoom calls. Music. We love having fun. Excuse me? Songs. Vic said something. Music. Songs. Music. I like having fun. I like to laugh. I like to meet people who can make me laugh. Please subscribe. No.